I mean, when you listen to phrases like we're singing, letting go, and this isn't about trying harder. This isn't about just trying to do better and being better. This is about becoming something. Yeah. This is what I noticed when I got saved. That everything he's saying and calling me to and creating me for is the total opposite of what I believed, what I was groomed in, and what I became growing up. And that's the biggest thing that hit my heart when I got saved. Because, see, I didn't get saved to go to heaven. I didn't get saved to escape hell. I didn't get saved to go to heaven. I didn't get saved to escape hell. I got saved to become what he created me to be and to become what he paid for. I got saved for his namesake, to be close to him, to be what it is that he designed me to be. I didn't get saved for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on. Come on. So I want to talk something with you today, just a little intimate, because these songs get to me, these guys. They tell me what I'm going to preach when they're singing. I'm like, what? Well, I'm like, oh, they, just things explode. You're, watching, you're looking, you're listening, you're looking around, people are up here, and you're... Yeah. Boom, yeah. Boom. You just get up and it's just, I want to say, without communion, there's unfulfillment. Without full communion? Oh! <laughs> I mean, you're just looking at it. That's, like, that's, that's a language that he spoke to me 22 years ago. Galatians says this that in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision, nor uncircumcision avails anything. It's a new creation. Yes, yes, yes. A new creation. None of us incorporated Jesus into our life. Even if we think we did, it doesn't work that way. He becomes your life. You become one with him. Who he is becomes who you are. Nothing avails anything. Circumcision or uncircumcision. It's not your flesh, the works of your flesh. It's not your doing. It's your being. Yeah? I, I know good-hearted people that try harder. They try not to sin. Bad idea. What do you mean bad idea? You try not to sin, you're just going to be sin conscious. You're always going to take your own tests. You're going to grade your own test. You're probably going to come up short. You'll probably fail. You'll probably be hard on yourself. You probably won't even show yourself much mercy and you'll call it diligence or something. And you'll live semi-condemned and put a veil over your face and probably won't be intimate with God because you won't see yourself the way He does. So you won't even feel like you can draw close to Him because you've already weighed yourself. It, it sounds strange, especially to an old school mentality. Like, if you just wake up and try to live acceptable, you'll come, I'm gonna come under condemnation. You have to wake up and be accepted. Yeah. Yes. Yes. You'll never live by grace if you're trying to live acceptable, if you're just trying harder, if you're trying not to sin. The gospel changes all that. See, that makes sense to men. That seems right. On the surface, that sounds like diligence, and that sounds like... But what it produces proves that it's not wisdom. I've never seen anybody wake up and try not to sin and do well and be real close to Jesus. Ever. I've never met one. You wake up and understand that you're washed and forgiven and cleansed and accepted and loved. If you wake up and focus on being His, you won't have to try not to sin. You'll be too busy being His. The Bible says if I put on righteousness and present my members unto righteousness, that means standing right in the sight of God. Right in the sight of God. You wake up right because the blood's speaking better things. See, there's a difference between rightness and righteousness. Rightness makes you wrong. Righteousness makes wrong things right. It's different. If God came and judged the earth in rightness, we're wrong. But he rules his kingdom with the scepter of righteousness. And he makes things that were wrong, he makes them right. Yes. Come on. The debt's been paid. Yeah. 
He brought the mountain down and the valley up. We're on a fair, smooth playing ground. We've all been blessed by the mercy of God through the righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ, invited to intimacy and fellowship and co-union with Holy Spirit. That sounds better. So I wake up clean. I wake up forgiven. I wake up righteous. I wake up His. I'm not trying to be His. I am His. I see that a high priest, Jesus, has come through the heavens. He's the Son of God. And I come boldly, not arrogantly, not presumptuously, just full of confidence that God so loved me. Man. See, that message invokes relationship. The other message invokes service. And you always owe something. And the debt's never paid. There's no relationship there. For God so... Aren't you glad it doesn't say, for God was so antagonized, frustrated, and at wit's end with humanity, that He finally pulled out the ace in the hole and went for broke and sent His Son. Because then we'd have to preach legalism. The reason we don't preach legalism is because God so loved. The reason I don't have to do anything to be anything. It's what got Paul beat over and over and over. Because in a legalistic doing society, he preached man is saved by grace. And they stoned him for it. And yet it's the gospel. The pure in heart shall see God. And that's what I want to talk about a little bit today. I want to talk about how simple it is to be transformed, not frustrating, and not a long process. That stretches people because people say, well, I'm processing, brother. And 10 years later, they got some of the same things and they're like, well, he's doing a work in me. And now 18 years in, they've learned a language called Christianese, but they haven't become more like you. Just saying. Well, it takes a while, brother. He's working. He's not missing the chisel. (laughs) You got to yield and adapt yourself to him. You got to. It's just like a marriage. The Bible says, husbands. Love your wives. That's what it says. And then, and then it, it, it says, wives, you're to submit to your own husbands as unto the Lord. And it's amazing how that's been hammered and preached. And, and you wives have become the servants of the men. It's just crazy. <laughs> it says, wives, submit to your own husbands as unto the Lord. And that's the only thing he says to the wife. And then the rest of the chapter is to the husband. Husband, love your wife. She tells you to wash her and nurture her with the water of the word and love her just like Christ loved church. The whole thing's to the husband and we take the word submit and turn it into slavery. The word submit, break it down, look at it. It means yield and adapt yourself to your own husband as you would to the Lord. You know how how you're reading your Bible, ladies, and you love the Lord, and you're reading your Bible, and you see something the Bible's calling you to, the Word's calling you to, and you get a conviction in your heart, and you go, oh, wow. And, 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 and in your heart right now, you have this desire, but the Bible's calling you here. So you make adjustments, you pray, you weep a little, and you begin to position yourself for change. You position yourself to love Him, to yield to Him, to become more like Him, right? It's the same thing in your marriage. You get married and preferences get different. Sometimes you don't have straight up agreement on every detail. Why do you have to have a feud? Because you don't have agreement. Love's supposed to be greater. Love, love doesn't mean you agree on everything. Love means I love you. So that word submit just means yield and adapt yourself. Yield and adapt yourself to your own husband. So you yield and adapt yourself. So we do that to the Lord. We yield and adapt ourselves to Him. We, we're clay. He's the potter. The clay doesn't make itself into anything. The clay will always be clay unless it's placed in the hand of the potter. 
If you study out clay and the potter, it's a neat teaching. If, you, if you're into them kind of teachings, it's, it's just neat. The potter, if the, if the clay is not pliable, if it's not moist enough, if it's not in the right condition, where would that come in with you? Just yielded, truly yielded, sincere. Come on, sincere. Let me tell you what qualifies sincerity. When you take your convictions and get alone with God, take a walk, shut a door, shut everything down till you get a hold of your conviction before the Lord so He gets a hold of you. That's sincere. It's one thing to get convicted. It's another thing to follow through with it and act out on it. Put yourself in a place where it's just you and Him. And say, you know what? I believe you see me this way. I believe you made me for this. Lord, I haven't been walking in this. I haven't even felt this desire in my heart, but I realize you've called me to this and I'm yielding to you and I'm asking you, Holy Spirit, to just begin to empower me and stir my heart and steer me into this place because I see this is what you've created me for. God, I just renounce this and I let it go. And Lord, it's not that I'm biting my lip trying not to do it anymore. I don't believe it's what I'm called to be and I don't believe it's what I want to be anymore. I'm convicted. You have my attention. There's change in my life. You talk like that to God and stay very answer conscious. Now, I can't believe I did that. God, would you please forgive me? God, I am such a mess up, Father. When are you going to change this old wretched heart? You will never be changed talking like that. That's how people pray. They get in a room and they get self-conscious and they pray out all their problems and all their sins and all their bad stuff. And we call that confession. I call it a messed up identity and you'll leave the room worse off than when you went in. You'll be more aware and focused on what's wrong with you than what he makes right. I wonder if you know something's wrong in your life and you get convicted and you say, man, I got to deal with this. And you walk in your room. Wouldn't it be amazing to walk in humbly and God sees your heart and the fact that you're there. And you just close the door. Lord, I'm done being in denial. I've been letting this thing rake my conscience for three weeks now and I haven't even talked to you about it. Thanks for forgiving me. Thanks for loving me. See, when you ask him to forgive you, you always wonder if you're forgiven. That's how people get it. It's strange. Your language, just changing your view is so simple. Thank you for forgiving me. Because you are confessing it. You are taking response. Thanks for forgiving me. Man, if I confess my sin to you, you're faithful and just to forgive me and cleanse me of all. I thank you that, God, I'm not standing here dirty. I'm not filthy. I'm not disgusting to you. You pulled me out of darkness. You brought me into the light. You are the one that's washing me and making me clean and maturing me through all this stuff into the man you've called me to be. God, I am done denying what's going on in my conscience. That is nothing to do with what I'm created for, nothing to do with what I'm called to. I give up the right to believe that, to feel that way. I'm done holding them so accountable, God. I want to see them through your eyes and I yield myself to you and I thank you for the work you're doing in my life. Holy Spirit, I welcome you and thank you for being a friend to me and leading me in truth. And, ah, you're either out of your mind and need to go play tennis or get a hobby or God's in the room and he's going to change you. Yeah? So you say, I am sincere. When you're sincere, sincerity puts you in that place. Sincerity has a fruit to it. You can procrastinate, you can say the right things and never position yourself for them. And then you live with a, a convicted conscience or violated conscience for long enough, you slowly get condemned. If all you do is just read your Bible and just read your Bible and just read your Bible and don't get along with Him and apply your convictions of what you're getting through the Bible to relationships so His grace can make you what you're reading. You'll get so full of the knowledge of God without the revelation of God in your life that the Word will turn on you and judge you even though He's not judging you. You have so much knowledge and you'll start weighing your knowledge against your life and you'll get condemned and you'll take your own test and be your own judge. And you'll decide how valuable you are and you'll decide how good you're doing. You, you're not the teacher and the student. You don't take the test and then judge the score. You wake up and enjoy being His. I've watched the Word because the book's alive. Ugh. And if you don't grow in relationship and the understanding with grace, this works thing, this legalistic thing, this judgmental thing will come in and the knowledge of the Word will turn You'll, you'll let it shift and judge where you're not instead of inspire where you're called. Does that make sense? And then you'll say stuff like this. 
way that seemeth right to a man. Seemeth right, seemeth right. You'll think it's humility. You'll think it's penitence or something. Well, you know, I'm bringing this on myself. I, I should know better. I mean, there's no repentance in that. There's judgment. Then you say, I'm getting what I deserve and should have dealt with this months ago. Okay, how's that going to redeem the situation? And how are you going to leave the day feeling any clearer about yourself in Christ than before? Because that's the goal. To see yourself in Him. To see yourself the way He sees you. I'm just giving some little practical general examples trying to help. I just know that this thing right here is never just quiet. <laughs> Musing and meditating constantly. You know, I've been sharing this lately. It's been on my heart to amplify and clarify this. A high IQ, intellect, is a gift. To have a high IQ doesn't mean it's, mean it's a curse and you're so intellectual. I think that's cool if you have a high intellect. Analytical yeah. is not a gift. Right. Analytical is never the Lord. I'll explain it. Oh, I feel that a little bit. <laughs> People say, well, I'm just analytical. Stop boasting. It's not a gift. People say, well, God gave us the ability to reason. Not in analytical thinking. Here's what analytical thinking does. It empowers you to talk yourself out of Him. To talk yourself out of worthy. To talk yourself out of love. It makes simple things complicated. God loves you. I don't know how He can love me. Eh, loves you. Well, yeah, but I have a hard time believing he can love me after all that. I mean, I knew for years I've been in church and I went against. Eh, loves you. How can you be so sure, brother? Because Christ is hanging on that tree. Love you. Here's what he's not saying. Take a good look at me, people. I hope you're satisfied now. Look what your sin has done to me. Don't you think it's time to change and turn and repent and come back to the Father? Hope you get the message, guys. Time for change. It's never the cross. Don't you ever preach the gospel that way. Here's the cross. I love you. I know who you are. I've known you from the beginning. I know why you're here. I know your purpose. I know your potential. Your lives have great value to me. It's why the Father's pleased to let this happen to me. So that in my dying, you can live. In my raising, you could be justified. That we could get the lie off of you and put the truth back into you. You're worth every penny of this sacrifice. You're worth it to us. Nobody buys what they don't think has the value they're paying for. Your life is worth my blood. Your life is worth my life. Come to me and live. That's the cross. It's the goodness. No preacher in my life ever told me that he hung on the cross because of my value. They all told me he hung on the cross because of my sin. Oh, he had to die because I sinned. I get that. But that's not a play on words. Of course he had to die because I sinned, but he didn't die because I'm a sinner. He died because I was a lost son. He died because my created value was subverted and covered over by sin and selfishness had taken over love and my purpose and reason for being got shaded and clouded and I went from being in the image of God to a form and back to the clay. So Jesus does what he does, raises from the dead and life breathes back into man and now we have the garden again. The tree's still there and the voice is still whispering. Follow him. And the blood is speaking better things. Paul says, what should we do? Sin because we're under grace and not the law? Certainly not. God forbid. Right? It's so powerful. Why do I preach this way all the time? Because nobody loves God first. Unless they see his first love. You be honest with me. Growing up as a youngster. How many felt more indebted towards God than in love with God? How many watched a crucifixion movie and thought, wow, 
preacher said my sin did that to him. He really took a beating. I'm not sure living much for him and I don't feel like I can change. And you felt guilty watching that stuff. And even though your heart moved and you believed in him, you didn't know how to change. And you never fully felt real close to him. You never felt like this growing up, most of us. Who relates to what I'm saying? And, it, and I quit going to church. That was my choice. 18 years old. Just stopped going. Saw some dysfunction in a leader. And, and saw some messing around. And, and judged it and said, well, if this is the cross. And this is Christianity. And this is Christianity and the gospel. I don't want nothing to do with it. No, it's not. That's the weakness and fallacies of men. It doesn't change God. But it's amazing how we look at people representing God or speaking God as the image of God. So then we look at their image and get a... Yeah? So by the age of 20, I didn't want nothing to do with church. So for 13 long years, I didn't go nowhere. Dark, sad time. And Jesus showed up at work one day. Just walked in, spoke to my heart, and I thought it was my mind. And he changed me forever. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> I'm just so glad. <laughs> I'll take that. Why did he do that? Because he loved me. And where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. So he called me out of darkness and brought me into the light. Seemed like I had a debt I could never pay. Seemed like I owed him more than I could give. So he said, I'll tell you what, I'll give. And I'll put everything you are on my son. So everything in my son can come back into you. And I'll just do this great exchange, the innocent for the guilty, and you'll go free. And I go, well, you're amazing. Yeah, I love you. This amazing love for you is stirring in my heart. You make me love you. Yeah, that's the point, Dan. I've loved you from the beginning. I want to restore what we had from the beginning. Lord, I really, really love you. Yeah, I know. It's because I loved you from the beginning. Wow, I love you. <laughs> that sure beats serving the Lord. <laughs> letting your Christian service take the place of knowing Him. Letting the ministry you serve in take the place of knowing Him. Because yeah. yeah. serving in the ministry won't change your disposition. That's right. That's right. Knowing Him will. Yeah. Serving in the ministry won't change your motives. Right. Knowing Him will. You can serve in the ministry and start feeling like people owe you. You can serve in the ministry and be indignant towards people and still have preferences and be biased. You can serve in the ministry for affirmation and then when they don't give it, you can get hurt and go serve in another ministry. And carry that hurt with you. And after four ministries, you're a hurting mess. And you don't need an altar call. You don't need ministry at the altar. You need to change your mind. And you need to change your heart. Right. There ain't enough prayer on the planet. It ain't about prayer. It's about truth. Yep. Yes. It's about truth. It's not always about prayer. Yeah. I need prayer. No, you might need truth. Yep. I never read a scripture that said ministry makes you free. Yep. But I did read a scripture that said truth will. I wonder if you just need to believe a little different. I wonder if you need to just see a little different because your eye is the lamp of your body. And if you see clear, you'll be clear. It says if you don't see clear, you won't be clear. And if you don't see clear, just how clear won't you be? That's my paraphrase. It's, it goes like this. The eye is the lamp of your body. And if your eye is single, your whole body is flooded with light. If your eye's not single, darkness encroaches. And if the light in you, see what you're created for? If the light in you is darkness, just how great is the darkness? It means how twisted is your view? So if what you're believing is producing darkness, it cannot be truth. If what you're thinking and believing isn't producing life and exciting your heart and moving you forward in God, you're believing a lie. He came to give you life, and life more abundantly. Right. Yeah, but brother, you don't understand my situation. No, stop. You're raising your situation above what I'm preaching so you can't hear what I'm preaching. You're making your situation matter more than the truth that wants to rescue you out of that lie. Yeah. Why do your circumstances have to change for you to change? 
Why does your trouble have to go? Jesus did not put out the fire, fourth man in the furnace, Nebuchadnezzar's fire, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. Jesus did not bring myriads of angels with holy water and douse the fire. The fire kept raging. To put out the fire is to honor it. To say it's a threat to them. The fire's not the problem. It's wrong believing. It's getting your eyes on something that doesn't matter most. It's worshiping something that's not the Lord. Whether it's your own life, whether it's your own person, whether it's your own well-being, that can all be idolatry. The only way you overcome is to love not your own life unto death. So the thing that's a problem is not the fire. It's never the fire. Never the fire. Most of us are praying that there's no fire because we're afraid of fire. Just this message freaks people out sometimes. They think, what are you doing, prophesying trials? No, the Bible says the wise man's going through the same storm as the foolish. It's not because he opened a door. It's because he heard the word. And Satan comes for the word's sake, not your sake. He ain't afraid of you at all. He's afraid of the word. And the reason you become a focal point is because the word was put into you. And now you can be something that he's very threatened by. He ain't after you. You don't take him person. You take the gospel person. Become what God paid for. And you take no account of these things. It's not about you going through hardship. It's about you becoming the person he created for you to be and standing strong. It, it flips me out, that story. That, that, that story flips me out with a fire, Nebuchadnezzar, because the king gave an urgent decree to make it seven times hotter. Well, that's, that's symbolic in New Testament faith of you and I just praying and believing for something. We take our faith stand. That's what they did. They took their faith stand, and they wouldn't bow to the king. He said, oh, fine. Okay, hot shots. Well, then we'll just crank up the fire seven times more. That's like you getting a diagnosis of cancer and, and you, you, you get revved up, you start crying a little, but you grab the word and you're doing the best you can and you come to church and we all gather and everybody anoints you with oil and the music's playing and Jeff is just nailing it and it just feels so amazing and you're like, God was there and you get your next test and the numbers are just a little higher. That's where you find out what you believe. Yeah. That's right. come on. Anybody can pray when they have a problem. And anybody can reduce this book to principles we're applying, hoping to get help. But when those numbers get a little higher, you find out what you believe. That's right. You find out if your motive is life or death or the kingdom of God. Are you trying to survive? Or are you going to stand and believe? Is the motivation to your prayers the fear of death or the promise of life? Is it sentiment and family and seeing so-and-so get married and my grand... That's, we go sentimental all the time. I see it all the time. And then we get confused and wonder where the fruit and the results of our prayers are. You seek ye first the kingdom of God. In fact, the only reason I want to live... I love my granddaughter. But the reason I want to live is not to just watch her grow up. That's sentimental. That'll get cut down like an axe to a tree. The number one reason is the kingdom of God. Because only in that motive will I have the best with her anyway. <laughs> and my love will always be love and it'll never be self-centered. It'll never be her loving me. It'll be me loving her. That's healthy. That do you love me is twisted. Because you're saying I love you for me. I love you for how you make me feel. I love you for the stability you bring. I just love you. You just mean everything to me. I don't know what I'd do without you. There's only one that deserves that. And there's only one that truly fits that. It's not a Hollywood movie, love. It's not a starry-eyed moment. It's not a feeling and a rush of emotion. It's a surrendered life for the sake of another. Love is a surrendered life for the sake of another. <laughs> and we're called to love. The goal of our instructions love. 
So if, if I'm walking in love and I'm a surrendered life for the sake of another, where's offense? Where's offense? Where's frustration? Where's discouragement have a place to land? All of a sudden it loses its voice and its reality goes out the window because I'm not in the world. Or I'm in the world, but I'm not of the world. So it's not, those things aren't alive where I live. <laughs> Are you following me? They're not in the kingdom. Your will be done on as it is in. So we grasp that where the power of God's. Okay, no cancer in heaven, no cancer on the earth. And he musters up faith to pray. And it's true. It's scriptural. It's good. I'm not putting that down. But why is it always the power of God? Why is your will be done on earth as it is in heaven always have to do with miracles and the power of God? Why isn't it more the heart of God? The nature of God and the person of God. Your will be done. There's no animosity in heaven. There's no unforgiveness. Zero. Mercy rules and reigns. Your will be done on earth as He is. He is love. He is love. He is love. In this love is perfected. We have boldness in the day of judgment because as He is, so are in the world. Love is the goal. If we miss love, we miss the point of why He came. He didn't come to fill your baskets and your barns. He came to fill your heart with the fullness of who He is. And above all these things, know the love of Christ which passes knowledge. Know the love of Christ which passes knowledge is to be filled with all the fullness of God. The word means a house with no empty rooms. You have a no vacancy sign over you. You're fully and completely occupied. <laughs> You're a ship so full of cargo, there's no space to lay another box. You are His, and you are complete, and you are fulfilled. I found my life in Him, my identity in Him, and my destiny in Him. My eyes are fixed on Him. Now I'm ready to live my life and love the world. Come on, that's Christianity. I'm going to be straight. Anything less isn't. So let's grow into this truth and become this truth and give our hearts to this truth. That's not condemning when I say anything else isn't. What I mean is it will not fulfill what he paid for. And you know how loving God is? You buy a car and it don't run the way it should, you take it right back to the dealer. If it don't run right again and again, now it's a lemon and there's laws. Now you got a lemon. You're never a lemon in the sight of God. wonder if God walked into your bedroom on the day you missed it and said, are you kidding me? I killed my son for this. You wouldn't even be able to live. You couldn't bear that. You would melt through the carpet. And yet some people preach that way. That is not what will change a man's life. Could you imagine God doing that? He won't. He never will. Why? Because he's love and he's not an enabler. He's a life changer. <laughs> and all of a sudden you don't get what you know you deserve. That's designed to humble you. That's designed to get you to lift your eyes up from whence came your help. And start being in love. I don't love him because I'm supposed to. I don't love him because it's the right thing to do. He wins your heart. You can't make yourself love him. You love him because you see who he is and you see how he sees you. And all of a sudden the mystery's revealed. And it's not, I can't believe he loves me. How can he love someone like me? All of a sudden you realize your value isn't based on the way you've lived your life. Your value is based on what he created you for. Whew. You guys good? I'm almost done. Listen, without relationship, without coming to Him, without humbling yourself under His mighty hand, how will you ever be lifted up? What, how will your life change by you trying to change it? Some of you had, in this room had convictions for a long time and you trying to change it hasn't worked. It never will. You wanting it changed. I'm not against 
a little bit of discipline in your life and buffeting your body like Paul talks about. I'm not against that. The end result comes by grace. You are what you are by the grace of God. When you see your life changing, here's how it works. You're saved by grace through... When you look in the Word and see what you're called to and created for, and you see all these commandments of what God has called you to, and you take them as privileges, not responsibilities, and you go into prayer, and you start putting on those things by faith, and you start thanking God and agreeing with what you're created for, and agreeing with love, and putting off human rights, and human reasoning, and, 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 and just expectations on people. God, I surrender these things. Here's how it sounds like when I'm alone. Father, I thank you no one owes me anything. The whole reason I'm alive is to love, and love doesn't seek its own. You have crushed the lie of selfishness in my life, and you have removed selfishness far from me, God. I thank you, Holy Spirit, that you'll lead me in this truth always. And if ever I sway over onto this weak side, you will cause me to know, make me aware immediately, because you're my friend. You're in me, and you guide me and lead me in all truth. Thank you for forming Christ in me. Thank you for revealing Christ through me. God, I am so given to you, and I am so surrendered to you, Father. I call Oh, you father, that makes me your son. I thank you for loving. I just talk like that. I'll be driving and just talk like that. Thanks for fathering me. God, thank you for just being a friend and a father to me. Thank you for empowering me to be a friend to you like you are to me and to just live my life by your spirit. Holy Spirit, you're awesome inside of me. I love you so much living in me. That sure beats wondering where God is. <laughs> Looking in the mirror and going, ugh. <laughs> Probably I'll look in the mirror and say, there you are. <laughs> and I'll be driving and, and I'm figure, figuring out where I'm going. And you check your mirror. You look and you catch your rear view. And every once in a while, I have a turn where I just see my own eyes. And I go, oh, 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 I see you. <laughs> he loves it when I do that. It's not a thing I do. It happens every once in a while. It just happens. It's spontaneous. But he loves it. His presence manifests in my little truck. You wonder how God can come in there like that. And I don't teach feelings and manifestations much, but I'll tell you what, there's a place for knowing. Yeah. And I'll be like, I see you in there. And it's so childlike. I'm either totally goofy and out of my mind, which some of you might have assessed. <laughs> but he doesn't believe that. He believes that I believe him. And he likes that I believe he lives in me. Yeah. He likes that I believe he likes me. And he likes that I'm allowing that to teach me how to like myself in a healthy way. Where it's not vanity. Where I actually love who I've become because now I can fulfill the two greatest commandments. I can love him with everything I am because he's loved me with everything he is. And I can love my neighbor as myself because I see myself clear. How are you going to love your neighbor as yourself when you don't even like you deep in your heart? When you're still holding yourself accountable for 10 years ago, three years ago, a year ago, when you're still identifying with what went wrong when you were four and five and six, when you went over to the babysitters and all you see is the trauma and you look in the mirror and all you see is the past years and the questions, why God? How are you going to love your neighbor when that's you and your view of yourself? How are you going to love your neighbor as yourself if that's your view of yourself? Yeah, I got the best look at you I've ever had in my life. Because I see myself in him. I know he sees you the same way. Yeah. He did this for all. And if he was busy loving me like that, he was loving you the whole time too. And you say, well, why was I touched wrong? I don't know why I was either. I don't even think about it. I think about being touched right. I think about delivered out of darkness. Delivered made whole. I think about new creation, not past things. I don't question why my dad was an alcoholic and why my mom died of sickness. It's not even on my mind. What's on my mind is Christ in me, the hope of glory. And we already won and we're heading. We're heading somewhere. So let's get in the race and run well and rejoice one day that we all believed and didn't grow weary in well-doing. Let's all rejoice that we didn't get sentimental and intellectual in the way of the analytical thing I talk about and just reason ourselves into a mess and find a reason to not be like him, to find a reason to not be encouraged, to come up with a reason and find a couple friends that aren't encouraged and then they become your support system and your soundboard. 
then all they can do is sympathize. They'll never help you if all they can do is sympathize. Bearing your heart to your hurting friends is not helping because all they do is accommodate you in your pain and understand it. And you call that sensitivity. I call it enablement. It's not that I'm not sorry that happened to you, but I can't be sentimental with you and say, I'm so sorry that happened to you. I can't believe they did that to you. That'll just make you cry harder because it happened. No, I'd be more in the line of, listen, I'm sorry people do what they do. Jesus said, forgive them, Father. They don't know what they do. If they had a revelation of him, they'd have never touched you wrong. If they had a revelation of, you, of him, they'd have never said that to you. If they had a revelation of him, they'd have never done what they did. I think we should be crying for them right now. Not, don't cry for yourself. Yeah. Listen to me. Don't let what they did decide who you yeah. are when what he did is greater. And don't become a product of what you've been through when he went through something to identify you. I need you to make the shift with me right now. Look, I'm being a friend. You don't need me to cry with you. You need me to pull you out of this thing. You are not stereotyped. You are not a statistic. You are his. Now let's get up and live like it. Yeah? That's how I'd talk to you as your pastor if your spouse just left you. I'd talk to you 20 minutes after you found out your spouse left and you're a heaping mess sobbing. I would have that conversation with you after I cried with you for 20 or 30 seconds, but you won't get more than that. If I cry 20, 30 seconds, you see I care, you have enough because I can't force tears. But I got to pull myself out of that because I can't just hold you and be sorry they did that. I got to look you right in the eyes and say, listen, this isn't too soon to tell you this. You are not the product of what one person did unless their name is Jesus. I am sorry you made this terrible decision. Yes, there's things we're going to have to walk through, and I know we got to talk about the kids. I am sorry they chose this path, but don't you let what they did decide who you are, and yeah. don't you let what they don't see decide what you do see. Yes. Your life is more yes. than what they did. You are no less anointed, you are no less called, and you have no less destiny. So now is the time we need faith, and now is the time we need to trust God. So every song we've ever sang together in church, and every message you've ever heard, now it's the time to apply these things. You don't apply these things so they don't happen, you apply these things if they do happen. When they happen, it's more important to have faith. That's how I pastor. I know you would pastor that way. Yeah? And you would know I care, and I'm not being hardcore. Because I would weep with you while I'm talking to you. Because I so wish they didn't choose that. Because it's real, and it causes ramifications. But it doesn't have to mark you and stereotype your life, and three years later, you're still not the same. Four years later, you're with somebody else, and it's not because you're complete, it's because you're in need. And you can't even do that justice, because you're still scarred by this, and you're always looking over your shoulder. Now they're bearing the brunt of your bondage. It's amazing how people split and are with somebody significant immediately. I'd rather you be with him. In such a way that you get so complete that if you are ever with somebody, it's out of the fullness of your life, not the vacuum. Don't you let people try to take the place of what only he can be. Please be with him. Yes. Please get alone with him. Please talk to him, commune with him, letting go, putting off things that aren't productive, putting off mentalities, call them dead, expose them, stop justifying them. If they're not producing life, they're not the Lord. If they're not bringing out the best in others, they're not the Lord. Yeah? yeah. And you put off in prayer and you put on. Can you help me? Can you come and play something? I don't usually do this, but I feel this in my heart. God, you're good. Let's together as a family make a big forward step in communion with Him. Can we do this as a family? It's not an order call. You stay right where you're at. But Jeff's going to just play and, and touch the keys. Whatever you, whatever you want to flow and play soft there, even if it's just keys and music for a while. If a song comes to you, you know what? I totally trust Jesus in you, buddy. When they heard me preach, they heard this message, they went bonkers. <laughs> He didn't want to come because I just did a service in a little garage in Mississippi. And he said, can I squeal on you? He said, I was so jaded by things and conferences. He said, I said, I ain't going the whole way down there for that. If this guy was anybody, it was good. He wouldn't be in no garage. 
But I'll never forget it. I started sharing and there's Jeff and Suzanne sitting and he's crying in the first five minutes. And he said, I just never witnessed anybody preach with such conviction and embody what they were saying and they were so real about it. It just, he said, but see, that's, that's Christ in us. That's, we can all be that way. Guys, you can carry that conviction in your workplace because you've been with him. Because you've been with him. Like, it's not going to happen if you haven't been with Him. It's not going to happen because you listened to somebody on YouTube or sat under great teaching on Sundays and Wednesdays. It's only going to become life when you be with Him. You're saved by grace through faith. When you get alone with Him and you release faith in His presence, faith all alone, you actually believe enough to be alone and block out time to just be with Him. That's where grace comes and meets your faith. And watch. Grace starts making that truth, that thing you're seeking, grace starts making it your reality. And all of a sudden you come out of the room and you don't even realize it. You're different. You're changed. You start thinking different, processing different, responding different. And all of a sudden you realize, because people say, what happened to you? Man, you're not this. Man, you this. And you, you didn't try it. You just been with him and you didn't bite your lip and try not to get angry. That means you're angry. That means you have it down inside. Anger management is not the kingdom. Putting it off is the kingdom. Anger management's hypocrisy. It means I'm harboring it, I'm just not expressing it. I'm controlling it. I have such discipline. Oh, I feel this way about Jason, but I ain't gonna show it. I'm gonna control it because I'm the master of my life. I'm in control. Look, when the thing's not in him, you don't want it in you. It's not anger management. It's put it off. Deal with your heart. He said, if you've got selfish seeking in you, self-seeking in you, don't boast and lie against the truth and appear to be something you haven't become. Deal with that. Get alone with God. Surrender it. Tell him, you were never created for you. I realize you never created me for me. I've prayed for me. I've cried for me. I've hurt for me. And a lot of times haven't even liked me. God, I'm done with this confusing rat race. I, the best I understand, am putting me off in your presence and asking you to help me, Holy Spirit, to learn what it means to deny myself, pick up my cross and follow you. But I honor you. No one has loved me like you love me. No one has forgiven me and been to me what you are to me and I want the beauty of what I see in you to be the beauty of what people see in me transform my life and make me one with you in every way not just spiritually and positionally but tangibly God I give myself to you you can pray that way when nobody's looking and that's what transforms your life wanting to be different will never do it you'll just weigh what you're not Doing that right there, that right there, transforming. It reveals your sincerity, it marks your faith, and it welcomes Holy Spirit. And then you are what you are by the grace of God. So the more you see yourself changing and the more people see you changing, the more you cry and say, oh my goodness, you're so good. You're really doing this in me. Ah! And then don't be afraid you'll get like me. Don't let that deter you. I'm just me. You be the best you. But what happens is you go, oh my goodness. Or you just go through the biggest thing at work where you know you'd have been a basket case. And suddenly you realize you didn't even see it that way and it didn't even affect you. And you're driving home and you realize two months ago I had to fell apart and I didn't even think about being shook. And all of a sudden you're in your car weeping. Wouldn't it be great if you have to pull over on the shoulder and just weep? Because you know he's working in you effectually. Because you've been with him you've been with him please don't talk about him please don't just listen to songs about him and fail to be with him please don't just say what he says and not be with him please don't let knowing about him take the place of knowing him because this is eternal life this is eternal life that you might know him so we're going to enter in right now to just a little moment I'm going to just probably just forget you're in the room for a second And I want you to forget I'm in the room. And I want to help springboard you if you've been struggling. If you're struggling at home, just getting alone with him, if you don't know what to say, or you just feel self-conscious, 
get the communion elements. Just grab the bread and the cup and go in a bedroom and start remembering Him. Just go back to Sunday school and children's church and the things you've learned in your life, even in services, and, and just lift your eyes up to the ceiling and keep them open maybe and just, Jesus, this represents your body. Let it be a springboard to communication. Let the communion elements be a springboard to stir your heart and trigger your language. The Lord taught me a long time ago. He said, people lack intimacy with me. They don't get close to me. Teach communion as a springboard to intimacy. Start talking about his body. You gave your life for me. Not because you were mad at me. Not because you felt sorry for me. Because you loved me and you knew that what I was living, I'm so much more in you. Thank you for not giving up on me. Thank you for not judging me. Thank you for not coming mad. Just a humble, meek, loving Savior. Gentle and kind. But so powerful. The lion and the lamb. It's amazing. Thanks for what you've done. The best I understand, I yield my body to you and I give myself to you and I ask you to mold me and shape me into everything you desire. Thank you for covenant. And you take, you just activate your heart. You take the cup and then you just begin to talk to him and be real. Just like if we were driving in the car and you're asking questions, pastoral questions, ministry questions. Just get along with God. Just be with him. But when you get with him, know this. He loves you. And he wants to father you. So Father, we just come to you in closing right now. And we're just going to open our heart and we're going to say, we believe that you love us. I'm going to get personal now. I want you to activate faith. And even if you just listen a little as an example of what I'm doing, and you just start activating your heart and personalize it, it's a good step. I saw to do this. I felt like God wants to springboard us in to intimacy. And just have a little corporate time together that inspires us to go be alone with him. Father, I thank you that you love me. I thank you that over years of weakness and misunderstanding and reactions to life, you never changed your mind about me. You never changed your mind about my value. You never changed your mind about my destiny. You did not rewrite a book out in front of me. But instead you wooed me and you drew me and you came to me and you turned my heart to you. And I thank you that you're not mad at me. I thank you that you forgive me. I thank you that you wash me clean of everything that I have ever done. I thank you that you're pleased to give me the kingdom. You said I should never fear. And you called me a little sheep in the flock. And never to fear because it's your good pleasure. It's not your burden. It's not your obligation. It's your pleasure to give me the kingdom. And I just thank you for giving me who you are and the way you function. And I thank you that the depths of your heart and the depths of your being become the reality of my life. I don't want to just serve you. I don't just want to do good deeds. I don't want to be seen by men as a, as a, as a, as a good doer or a do-gooder. I want to be seen as yours. I want to be seen for your image, for your love, for your nature. And I just thank you. You're doing a work on the inside of me. I give you my why. I give you my motives. I give you my reason for being. I turn my mind to the kingdom. Father, I don't want affirmation. I don't want, I have no expectation on men. I, I release men. Men owe me nothing. Men don't owe me a thing. My own spouse owes me nothing. I realize I'm privileged to love her, to lay down my life and bring out the best in her and be rain on her life and let her flower bloom. I'm here to be like you are to me, to her. And I yield myself to you. She owes me nothing. Marriage isn't 50-50 and a lot of work. Marriage is I love you, Kim. And I thank you for the honor of love. And the way you love me is the way I want to always love her. And I thank you for empowering me. The way you love me as your son, I want to love my son. The way you love me as my son, as your son, I want to love my daughter. God, I yield myself to you. You're my teacher. Jesus, I don't want anything else teaching me. I see it in your life and I want it in mine. And I'm a big yes. Search my heart, God. Search it, Father. I'm a big yes. When I go to work, I want people to see who you are in me without me trying, without me striving. I don't want to have to yell through a bullhorn. I don't want to have to just wear a Christian t-shirt. I want them to see through my life. So do a work in me. I yield to you. I thank you, Lord. You're taking contentions out of me. The need to be right out of me. 
I put it all down. I lay it down. If it's not edifying, if it's not profitable, I don't want it in my life. If it doesn't bring life, stir life, impart life, I don't want it in me. I yield to you. Teach me what it means to be a man of God and let my life have impact. Let them know you a little more because they've met me. Let them know you a little more because they've worked beside me. Holy Spirit, empower me. Let them know you a little more because they've met me. Man, I want to live everything you paid for. And I don't want what the world taught me anymore is wisdom. I want a brand new thing, a new creation, a new mind, a new way, a new reason. Thanks for always loving me. Thanks for being so patient. Thank you I'm not a step away from breaking your heart. That you do nothing but father me. My desire is to never miss you. And even in weakness, you'll make me strong. And God, I am not banking on weakness. Today the weak is saying I am strong. You are the strength of my life. Did you not die for me? Did you not pull me out of sin? Did you not rescue me from darkness? Surely you'll empower me now that I'm in the light. Surely you'll save me from wrath through the one that lives. <laughs> Thank you for more than enough grace in my life. You took away all my flesh excuses. You took the blame off of everyone. And you've given me the right to just be yours. I yield myself to you. You're bringing great change in me. Because you love me. And your love will never fail. I want you to thank him right now that he loves you. You welcome Holy Spirit right now. To be your teacher and the one that forms Christ in you, the one that convicts you and leads you and guides you in all truth. Talk to Him. Don't, don't believe you have to do something for Him to want to come. He has always wanted to come. You just right now, right where you're at, you say, but you don't know my situation. I, I, I'm not talking about your situation. I'm talking about your heart right now before Him. You welcome Holy Spirit right now. And you let Holy Spirit, if you're sincere and you want this, you let Holy Spirit know that you want Him to lead you and guide you in all truth. That if you think anything outside of His truth, He would make you aware of that and give you a chance to adjust that. That He would keep truth in front of you all the time so you would always have the privilege of running well with it. Go ahead and be bold right now and tell Him that you want to be perfected in love. You want to be made to be loved. You're not praying for patience and be careful because if you ask for it, God will give it to you. No, no, no. Love is patient. You want to go for the package. You, you want to become love. Love is patient. Just tell him that. I want to become the love to others that you have been to me. It's so important to believe you're forgiven right now. Father, you forgive me of everything I've ever done. If you've forgiven me of everything I've ever done, who am I? to hold someone accountable for something they've done in a way where I shut up my heart or shut them up in my heart. Lord, I am done living like a man without you. I'm living like a man possessed by you. And I'm going to love them just like you love me. And I'm going to give them the space and opportunity to change like you gave me the space to change all these years. I honor you. And I want to do it with more than my words. I honor you with my life and thank you for the grace that empowers me. Come on, believe these things. Thank Him He loves you. Thank Him that He forgives you. And thank Him that Holy Spirit is here and willing to guide you in all truth. Let go of your rights right now. Every right that I assumed through Adam and, and he said, she said, and tit for tat. And well, I feel, well, I wouldn't if they didn't. Well, how come they had... I throw it all away. It's never produced anything good. All it ever has is justified me to be less than you. I'm done with that language. Nobody owes me a thing and I'm done with justifications and rightness. I'm done with human rights. My life's not going to be a talk show. My life's going to reveal you. Thank you for teaching me. Guiding me. Father, I thank you for this house. I thank you for every soul. 
I thank you for every heart encouraged. I thank you for an increased awareness of you and knowing from the head to the heart. A relational thing, God, that, that people would be with you. Take on the beauty of who you are. That everything they give birth to would look just like you. Let people look like they did in Acts and say, wow, they've been with him. I thank you, Lord. You're doing that in our lives. In Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Yeah. Guys, you can live here. You can stay here. You don't have to turn God into an appointment. You don't have to meet with him for an hour a day. He, he lives in you. Talk to him. Commune with him. Teach yourself to know him by being with him. I picked up the young man right here yesterday. I said, we wouldn't drive 50 miles and not talk. You know what's sweet? I still don't even really got his name sealed in me. I didn't even know if I asked or remembered. He might have told me, but it didn't stick in me. So I still don't even know his name. But watch this. If seven days in a row we drove 50 miles together and back and forth and we just hung out for a week that way and you mentioned his name after seven days with my heart I could say, oh yeah, I know him. Why? Because I've been with him. You don't know Jesus because you went to Sunday school. You don't know Jesus even because you knelt in an order one day. You know Jesus because you've been with Him. Nothing compares in your whole life to the ability to be with Him. It's given by God. The grace to be with Him. There's nothing that compares to that. Seeing a, a healing is amazing. Getting a word of knowledge is fun. But I promise you it pales being with Him. Be with him. Amen? Amen. I love you. I'm done. Bless you. Mr. Hooper. Amen.